One farmer says, seems to me there was a tea party in Boston that was illegal too. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold. We shall seek to establish and maintain a dollar which will not change its purchasing and debt-paying power during the succeeding generation. As anguished shrieks rose up from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Government credit and government currency are really one and the same thing. A reserve of gold and a small reserve of silver. So, um, and I said, well, what if it does happen? And he says, well, price will solve everything. I said, thanks, give me the gold. <laughs> Why do central banks hold it? Well, it's, it's the former reserves. So Why don't they hold diamonds? Well, it's tradition, long-term <laughs> tradition. Well, some people still think it's money. Welcome back to the Junius Mall B channel. There's always been a crossover of art and coinage. Some of the most beautiful and exquisite coins were carved and engraved by renowned artists, such as Augustus St. Gaudens, one of my favorite all-time coins. And many of them come out of the time period of the Victorian era and the 1800s, the 19th century. Uh, just a robust time for art in both Europe and the United States. There's a series of paintings that were done in this time period that I think are very important to show on this channel. And many of us can relate to them the times that we now find ourselves in make these series of paintings very relevant and they're actually getting more attention this day and age than uh, at any time in my life i mean i've seen them mentioned in numerous opinion pieces regarding the state of events and the geopolitical and economic backdrop we find ourselves in today these paintings were done by an artist named thomas cole and the series of paintings is called The Course of Empire. It's a series of five paintings. And they were done in the years 1833 to 1836. It's notable that in part for reflecting popular American sentiments of the times, when many saw pastoralism as the ideal phase of human civilization, fearing that empire would lead to gluttony and inevitable decay. The theme of cycles is one that Cole returned to frequently, such as in his The Voyage of Life series. The Course of Empire comprises the following works. The Course of Empire, The Savage State, The Arcadian, or Pastoral State, The Consummation of Empire, Destruction, and finally, Desolation. The series of paintings depicts the growth and fall of an imaginary city situated on the lower end of a river valley near its meeting with a bay of the sea. The valley is distinctively identifiable in each of the paintings, in part because of an unusual landmark. A large boulder is situated atop a crag overlooking the valley. Some critics believe this is meant to contrast the immutability of the earth with the transience of man. A direct source of literary inspiration for the course of empire paintings is Byron's chilled Harold's Pilgrimage, 1812-1818. Cole quoted lines from Canto the Fourth in his newspaper advertisements for the series. A quote by Bishop Berkeley also can be used to describe the series. First freedom, and then glory. When that fails, wealth, vice, corruption. Bishop Berkeley stated westward, the course of empire takes its way. Unquote. Cole designed these paintings to be displayed prominently in the picture gallery on the third floor of the mansion of his patron, Lumen Reed, at 13 Greenwich Street, New York City. The layout was approximately as shown here, according to Cole's installation diagram adopted to the fireplace. Now, there's one detail I find fascinating about the order of these paintings and the aspects of the sun. As you can see above the series of paintings here, when Cole was planning the layout, on the left side, that is the sunrise, the beginning of a new day. That's the aspect of the sun you can see on that left side with the earliest part of this fictitious city. In the middle, when the city is at its peak, the consummation, if you will, the sun is at its zenith, high noon, the middle of the day. 
It doesn't get any brighter than this. There's no more sunlight than this. And then on the right side, with the destruction, you see the sunset. That is the light for destruction and desolation. Whereas the very beginning was the sunrise, the noon in the middle, on the right side, the aspect of the sun shows the setting, the end of the day, the dusk. Soon comes the darkness. I think it's a very, uh, just an incredible thing that as an artist, Thomas Cole incorporated into this series of paintings. And if I had not done any further research on reading about these, because I find them fascinating, I wouldn't have come upon that fact and that uh, this diagram that shows how he laid it out. The first painting, The Savage State, shows the valley from the shore opposite the crag in the dim light of a dawning stormy day. Clouds and mist shroud much of the distant landscape, hinting at the uncertain future. A hunter, clad in skins, hastens through the wilderness, pursuing a fleeing deer. Canoes paddle up the river. On the far shore can be seen a clearing with a cluster of teepees around a fire, the nucleus of the city that is to be. The visual references are those of Native American life. This painting depicts the ideal state of the natural world. It is a healthy world unchanged by humanity. This is the description from Thomas Cole, number one, which may be called the savage state, or the commencement of empire, represents a wild scene of rocks, mountains, woods, and a bay of the ocean. The sun is rising from the sea, and the stormy clouds of night are dissipating before his rays. On the farthest side of the bay rises a precipitous hill, crowned by a singular isolated rock, which, to the mariner, would ever be a striking landmark. As the same locality is represented in each picture of the series, this rock identifies it. Although the observer's situation varies in the several pictures, the chase being the most characteristic occupation of savage life. In the foreground, we see a man attired in skins in pursuit of a deer, which, stricken by his arrow, is bounding down a water course. On the rocks in the middle ground are to be seen savages with dogs in pursuit of deer. On the water below may be seen several canoes, and on the promontory beyond are several huts and a number of figures dancing around a fire. In this picture we have the first rudiments of society. Men are banded together for mutual aid in the chase, etc. The useful arts have commenced in the construction of canoes, huts, and weapons. Two of the fine arts, music and poetry, have their germs, as we may suppose, in the singing which usually accompanies the dance of savages. The empire is asserted, although to a limited degree, over sea, land, and the animal kingdom. The season represented is spring. The Arcadian or Pastoral State in the second painting, the Arcadian, or pastoral state, the sky has cleared, and we are in the fresh morning of a day in spring or summer. The viewpoint has shifted further down the river, as the crag of the boulder is now on the left-hand side of the painting. A forked peak can be seen in the distance beyond. Much of the wilderness has given way to cultivated land and agriculture, with plowed fields and lawns visible. Various activities go on in the background, plowing, boat building, herding sheep, dancing. In the foreground, an old man sketches what may be a geometrical problem with a stick. On a bluff on the near side of the river, a megalithic temple has been built, and smoke, presumably from sacrifices, arises from it. The images reflect an idealized pre-urban, archaic Greece. This work shows humanity at peace with the land. The environment has been altered, but not so much so that it or its inhabitants are in danger. Yet the construction of the warship, and the concerned mother watching as her child sketches a soldier, herald the emerging imperial ambitions. The description from Thomas Cole for number two, the simple or Arcadian estate, it represents the scene after ages have passed. The gradual advancement of society has wrought a change in its aspect. The untracked and rude 
has been tamed and softened. Shepherds are tending their flocks. The plowman with his oxen is upturning the soil, and commerce begins to stretch her wings. A village is growing by the shore, and on the summit of a hill a rude temple has been erected, from which the smoke of sacrifice is now ascending. In the foreground, on the left, is seated an old man, who by describing lines in the sand seems to have made some geometrical discovery. And on the right of the picture is a female with a distaff, about to cross a rude stone bridge. On the stone is a boy who appears to be making a drawing of a man with a sword, and ascending the road, a soldier is partly seen. Under the trees, beyond the female figure, may be seen a group of peasants. Some are dancing, while one plays on a pipe. In this picture, we have agriculture, commerce, and religion. In the old man who describes the mathematical figure, in the rude attempt of the boy in drawing, in the female figure with the distaff, in the vessel on the stocks, and in the primitive temple on the hill, it is evident that the useful arts, the fine arts, and the sciences have made considerable progress. The scene is supposed to be viewed a few hours after sunrise in the early summer. The third painting, The Consummation of Empire, shifts the viewpoint to the opposite shore, approximately the site of the clearing in the first painting. It is noontide of a glorious summer day. Both sides of the river valley are now covered in colonnaded marble structures, whose steps run down into the water. The megalithic temple seems to have been transformed into a huge domed structure dominating the river bank. The mouth of the river is guarded by two pharaoh, and ships with lateen sails go out into the sea beyond. A joyous crowd gathers on the balconies and terraces as a scarlet-robed king, or victorious general, crosses a bridge connecting the two sides of the river in a triumphant procession. In the foreground, an elaborate fountain gushes. The look of the painting suggests the height of ancient Rome. The decadence seen in every detail of this cityscape foreshadows the inevitable fall of this mighty civilization. A description from Thomas Cole. In the picture number three, we suppose other ages have passed and the rude village has become a magnificent city. The part seen occupies both sides of the bay, which the observer has now crossed. It has been converted into a capacious harbor at whose entrance, toward the sea, stand two ferri. From the water on each hand, piles of architecture ascend, temples, colonnades, and domes. It is a day of rejoicing. A triumphal procession moves over the bridge near the foreground. The conqueror, robed in purple, is mounted in a car drawn by an elephant and surrounded by captives on foot, and a numerous train of guards, senators, etc. Pictures and golden treasures are carried before him. He is about to pass beneath the triumphal ark, whose girls strew flowers around. Gay festoons of drapery hang from the clustered columns. Golden trophies glitter above in the sun, and incense rises from silver censers. The harbor is alive with numerous vessels, war galleys, and barks with silken sails. Before the Doric temple on the left, the smoke of incense and of the altar rise, and a multitude of white-robed priests stand around on the marble steps. The statue of Minerva, with a victory in her hand, stands above the building of the Caryatides, on a columned pedestal, near which is a band with trumpets, cymbals, etc. On the right, near a bronze fountain and in the shadow of lofty buildings, is an imperial personage viewing the procession, surrounded by her children, attendants, and guard. In this scene is depicted the summit of human glory. The architecture, the ornamental embellishments, etc., show that wealth, power, knowledge, and taste have worked together and accomplished the highest meat of human achievement and empire. As the triumphal feat would indicate, man has conquered man, nations have been subjugated. This scene is represented as near midday in the early autumn. The fourth painting, Destruction, has almost the same perspective as the third, though the artist has stepped back a bit to allow a wider scene of the action and moved almost to the center of the river. The action is the sack and destruction of the city in the course of a tempest seen in the distance. It seems that a fleet of enemy warriors has overthrown the city's defenses, sailed up the river, and is busy ransacking the city and killing its inhabitants and raping women. 
The bridge across which the triumphant procession had crossed is broken. A makeshift crossing strains under the weight of soldiers and refugees. Columns are broken, and fire breaks from the upper floors of a palace on the river bank. In the foreground, a statue of some venerable hero, posed like the Borghese gladiator, stands headless, still striding forward into the uncertain future. In the waning light of late afternoon, the dead lie where they fell, in fountains and atop the monuments built to celebrate the affluence of the now-fallen civilization. The scene is perhaps suggested by the Vandal Sack of Rome in 455. On the other hand, a detail in the lower right of the quote, Consummation of Empire painting shows two children, maybe brothers fighting, one clad in red and the other in green, the colors of the banners of the two contending forces in destruction, which thus might depict a foreshadowed civil war. The children, now men, are shown, with one having finally prevailed over the other, but seemingly in contemplation of the heavy price paid. In the painting, the red and green banners are on different sides of the river, with the green banners mostly on the temple side and the red banners predominantly on the palace side, maybe showing the still ongoing war between traditionalism and modernism. Description from Thomas Cole. Number four. The picture represents the vicious state or state of destruction. Ages may have passed since the scene of glory, though the decline of nations is generally more rapid than their rise. Luxury has weakened and debased. A savage enemy has entered the city. A fierce tempest is raging. Walls and colonnades have been thrown down. Temples and palaces are burning. An arc of the bridge, over which the triumphal procession was passing in the former scene, has been battered down. And the broken pillars and ruins of war engines and the temporary bridge that has been thrown over indicate that this has been the scene of fierce contention. Now there is a mingled multitude battling on the narrow bridge, whose insecurity makes the conflict doubly fearful. Horses and men are precipitated into the foaming waters beneath. War galleys are contending. One vessel is in flames, and another is sinking beneath the prow of a superior foe. In the more distant part of the harbor, the contending vessels are dashed by the furious waves, and some are burning. Along the battlements, among the ruined caryatides, the contention is fierce, and the combatants fight amid the smoke and flame of prostrate edifices. In the foreground are several dead and dying. Some bodies have fallen in the basin of a fountain, tinging the waters with their blood. A female is seen sitting in mute despair over the dead body of her son, and a young woman is escaping from the ruffian grasp of a soldier by leaping over the battlement, Another soldier drags a woman by the hair down the steps that form part of the pedestal of a mutilated colossal statue whose shattered head lies on the pavement below. A barbarous and destroying enemy conquers and sacks the city. Description of this picture is perhaps needless. Carnage and destruction are its elements. The fifth painting, Desolation, shows the results decades later. We view the remains of the city in the livid light of a dying day. The landscape has begun to return to wilderness and no humans are to be seen, but the remnants of their architecture emerge from beneath a mantle of trees, ivy, and other overgrowth. The broken stumps of the Pharaoh loom in the background. The arches of the shattered bridge and the columns of the temple are still visible. A single column looms in the foreground, now a resting place for birds. The sunrise of the first painting is mirrored here by a moonrise, a pale light reflecting in the ruin-choked river, while the standing pillar reflects the last rays of sunset. This gloomy picture suggests how all empires could be after their fall. It is a harsh possible future in which humanity has been destroyed by its own hand. A description from Thomas Cole. The fifth picture is the scene of desolation. The sun has just set, the moon ascends the twilight sky over the ocean near the place where the sun rose in the first picture. Daylight fades away, and the shades of evening steal over the shattered and ivy-grown ruins of that once proud city. A lonely column stands near the foreground, on whose capital, which is illuminated by the last rays of the departed sun, a heron has built her nest. The Doric temple and the triumphal bridge may still be recognized among the ruins, but though man and his works have perished, the steep, 
promontory with its insulated rock still rears against the sky, unmoved and unchanged. Violence and time have crumbled the works of man, and art is again resolving into elemental nature. The gorgeous pageant has passed, the roar of battle has ceased, the multitude has sunk in the dust, and the empire is extinct. Although painted almost 200 years ago, I believe these series of paintings by Thomas Cole are full of meaning, full of symbols that apply to us today. Think of it. Think of even the time period he was painting them, 1830s. The new America, a brand new infant nation, with a frontier to be explored, settled. Now, in spite of all the history and the turmoil we, that occurred during those frontier years, just think of it for a moment. The, the Wild West, uh, the, the unexplored territories, and then the expansion that ensued, the building and growth of what became the industrial United States, highways, interstates, the cities. There was even some beautiful architecture in some of the cities. Stone buildings, bridges, causeways, and engineering feats and marvels like the Golden Gate Bridge and, uh, and so on. Of course, there was the Greco-Roman buildings constructed throughout the capital of Washington, D.C. And slowly, over the last 200 years, we've seen almost imperial nature, the expansion of what some would argue is an almost empire-like existence of the United States, policing the world, expanding militarily. And then, of course, came the debt, the large debt, similar to what collapsed and destroyed Rome, debasement, devaluations of currency, but also the debasement and devaluation of the morality, the fabric of the souls of all the citizens, infighting, divisions, schisms, just like we saw the green and the red fighting in the paintings just moments ago. We are in what I would believe would be that past that golden hour phase, that peak, that zenith of noon, and we are now moving into the, the painting that saw the turmoil, the war, the barbarism, the invading forces descending upon the capital. That is the series I believe we are in now. Soon to witness the collapse and then the decay as nature retakes that which man had claimed prior. 